Ron Paul, the delegate hunter, keeping his campaign going by picking and choosing his battles. We have the message in America needs at this particular time. I'm Congressman Ron Paul, for Congressman from Texas. I am the defender of the Constitution. I'm the champion of liberty. This shows the roadmap to peace and prosperity. Congressman Paul, you've questioned the conservative, fiscal conservative credentials of all these gentlemen, but, but particularly this week, Senator Santorum. You have a new television ad that labels him a fake. Why? Because he's a fake. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> no, I find it really fascinating that uh, when people are running for office, they're really fiscally conservative. When they're in office, they do something different. And then when they explain themselves, they say, oh, I want to repeal that. So the senator voted for uh, no child left behind. But now he voted for it. But now he's running on the effort to get rid of it. So I think the record is, is so bad, you know, with the politicians. And, uh, you, you know, um, nobody accuses me of not having voted for too much. They're always accusing me for not voting for enough. And uh, I've been running in office, in office off and on for a good many years, and over all those years, I've never voted for a budget uh, de deficit. I never voted to increase the national debt. Matter of fact, there's only one appropriation bill I voted for, uh, and that was for veterans. I assume from the 1970s on that we were in embarking on a very dangerous path, and we're involved in that danger right now. So this idea of being fiscally conservative uh, now that we're running for office and we're going to repeal something that we did before, I mean, this, it loses credibility is, is what our problem is. So, and, and, the, and the one thing uh, that I, I think should annoy all Americans is the voting for foreign aid. I mean, just think, uh, their foreign aid packages are huge, and when the member votes for it, they don't say, well, this money's going to ABC because I love that country, but it's the principle of the way the government works. You vote for foreign aid because, right. for some weird reason, it's supposed to be good for America, but then it goes and helps all our enemies. That's what I disapprove of. Senator. Senator Santorum, respond quickly. Ron, the, the Weekly Standard just did a, um, a review looking at the National Taxpayer Unions, I think Citizens Against Government Waste, and they measured me up against the other 50 senators who were serving when I did, and they said that I, that I was the most fiscally conservative senator uh, in, the, in the Congress in the 12 years that I was there. My, my ratings with the National Taxpayer Unions were A's or B's. They were very high from the Citizens Against Government Waste. I got a hero award. That's always a cop-out when you compare yourself to the other members of Congress. The American people are sick and tired of the members of Congress. They get about 9% rating. <laughs> But uh, this whole thing about comparison of conservative votes, I think you make a very important point. I don't rate one at the top. If it's spending or on taxes, I'm at the very top because I vote for the least amount of spending and the least amount of taxes, which means that some of the conservative ratings, you have to realize, sometimes conservatives want to spend money, too. When it comes to overseas spending, you vote for the foreign aid. Conservatives are quite pleased with spending money overseas, but if you're a strict uh, a fiscal conservative and a constitutionalist, you don't vote for that kind of stuff, and so you can't just go by the ratings. As you can see, this is a, it's an important issue to the people in the audience. I think it's one of the reasons this race has been so volatile. Uh, voters are looking and they're saying, which of these candidates can I trust? And the, and the bottom line was, when I was in the United States Senate, there was transparency in Congress and Paul who is one of the most prolific earmarksers in the Congress today, uh, is, uh, w would tell you, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying that that's a fact, right. that, that <laughs> he, Let me. he... Congressman Paul, answer Senator Santorum, please, sir. I followed that, and I... I <laughs> You know, there's reason for the confusion because uh, <laughs> because it's all Congress's fault. They're all messed up. They don't know what they're doing in Congress is the real reason. But this whole idea of earmarking, earmarking is designated how the money is spent. What a lot of people don't understand is if, if the Congress doesn't say the way the money should be spent, it goes to the executive branch. And that's the bad part. If you were actually cutting, it would make a difference. But you don't want to give more power to the executive branch. Even if I'm president, I don't want more power over that. That, over that funding. That should be with the people and, and with the Congress. But earmarking, uh, 
the reason we get into trouble is, is the irresponsibility of Congress. Take your highway funds. We're supposed to pay a user fee. We pay our gasoline tax. We should get our fair share back. But what do they do? They take the highway funds and other these trust funds, and they spend this money overseas in these wars that we shouldn't be fighting. And then when the highways need building, then you have to go and fight the political system and know who to deal with and maneuver and try to get some of your money back. But if you say you're against, uh, in, in, against the earmarking and fuss and fume over, the answer is vote against the bill. That is what I do. I argue for the case of the responsibility being on the Congress, but it's the responsibility of us who believe in fiscal conservatism to vote against the bill. We need a vote against the spending is what we need to do. Right. From CNNPolitics.com, and you can see it in the audience up on the board here, why was George W. Bush wrong in his efforts to save the auto industry, and why was Barack Obama wrong to continue the effort? You know, that's interesting that, that when they argue that case. First, I don't like the idea that you have good, good bailouts and bad bailouts. If bailouts are bad, they're bad, and we shouldn't be doing it. But this argument uh, about maybe one that works, you know, well, now uh, that the uh, bank bankruptcy or the bailing out of uh, GM work, I said that's sort of like uh, if a criminal goes out and robs a bank and he's successful, therefore you endorse what he did because he's successful. But you have to rob people. You have to distort the law. The government is supposed to protect contracts. They're not supposed to regulate contracts, and they're not supposed to undermine contracts. And that's what we've been doing. In the housing bubble, we undermine contracts. And this is what we're doing here. So you want to respect the contracts. A lot of people will accuse me of, of advocating a free market, that there's no regulations. Actually, the regulations are tougher because you have to go through bankruptcy and, and you have to face up to this. And it isn't like General Motors would be destroyed. Newt made that point there, that there were good parts of General Motors. But, but politicians can't figure this out. Then they serve the special interest. And then you have labor fighting big business. I opt uh, for the uh, free market and the defense of liberty. That's what we need in this country. <laughs> All right. We'll take a question now from CNNPolitics.com. You can see it up on the screen here. Since birth control is the latest hot topic, which candidate believes in birth control, and if not, why? Congressman Paul. As an OB doctor, I've dealt with birth control pills and uh, contraception for a long time. Um, this, this is a consequence of the fact the government has control of medical care and medical insurance, and then we fight over how we dictate how this should be distributed. Sort of like in schools, once the government takes over the schools, especially at the federal level, then there's no right position. Then you have to argue which prayer are you allowed to pray, and you get into all the details. The problem is the government is getting involved in things they shouldn't be involved, especially at the federal level. <laughs> But uh, sort of along the line of uh, the pills uh, creating the immorality, I don't see it that way. I think the immorality creates the problem of wanting to use the pills, so you don't blame the pills. I think it's sort of like the argument, conservatives use the argument all the time about guns. Guns don't kill, criminals kill. So in a way, it's the morality of society that we have to deal with. The pill is there and, you know, it contributes maybe, but the pills can't be blamed for the immorality of our society. It's an issue on which all of you have criticism of the Obama administration. It's an issue on which some of you have also criticized each other. Governor Romney, both Senator Santorum and Speaker Gingrich have said during your tenure as governor, you required Catholic hospitals to provide emergency contraception to rape victims. And Mr. Speaker, you compared the governor to President Obama, saying he infringed on Catholics' rights. Congressman, please. Quick follow up. You, you know, uh, we talk about the morning after pill. Actually, the morning after pill is nothing more than a birth control pill. So if birth control pills on the market, the, the morning after pill. So if you're going to legalize birth control pills, you've really, you can't sec uh, separate the two. They're all uh, they're basically the same uh, hormonally. But uh, w once again, the, the question is, if you, play, if you voted for Planned Parenthood, uh, like the senator has, you voted for birth control pills. And you literally, because funds are fungible, you literally, vote for abortion because Planned Parenthood gets the money, or oh, I'll buy birth control pills, but then they have the money left over to do the abortion. So that's why you have to have a pretty strong resistance to voting for these bunches of bills put together. Planned Parenthood should get nothing, let alone designate how they spend. Senator Santorum. As Congressman Paul knows, I, I oppose Title X funding. I, I've always opposed Title X funding, but it's included in a large appropriation bill that includes a whole host of other things, including 
the funding for the National Institutes of Health, the funding for Health and Human Services, and a whole bunch of other departments. It's a multi-billion dollar bill. John, this demonstrates the problem that I'm talking about. There's always an excuse uh, to do this. Now, plan... Title 20, I, would, I don't know whether you inferred that I would support Title 20 for abstinence. No, it would cost money as a program. It's not a program of the federal government to get involved in our lives this way. If you want laws like that, maybe to say, but the federal government shouldn't even be having, spending money on abstinence. That's way too much more. I don't see that in the Constitution. Any uh, just, just, remember, just a brief comment. Senator, I, I just saw a YouTube clip of you being interviewed where you said that you personally opposed contraceptives, but that you... You said that you voted for Title X, you, but you used that as an argument saying this is something I did proactively. You didn't say this is something I was opposed to. It was something I, I wouldn't have done. You said, this, you said this in a positive light. I voted for Title X. <laughs> I, I, I think I was making it clear that while I have a personal more objection to it, even though I, did, I don't support it, that I voted for bills that included it. And I made it very clear in subsequent interviews that I don't, I, I don't support that. I've never supported it. A recent federal analysis says the cost of secure fencing, which they have in a good deal of the border along this state, would cost about $3 million per mile. Is that a good investment, money well spent? Pro probably not, but we can do a better job. And the best way to do it is uh, forget about the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan and deal with our border and put the resources on this border. This is what we need. But, but we need to change the rules. We reward illegal immigration. Uh, they get benefits. Texas hospitals and, uh, uh, you know, schools are going bankrupt. Uh, and the restraints on the states and Obama's restraints on, on the states to do with it. Why isn't if an illegal comes across the border and they go on private property, why isn't that trespassing? And why don't you have the right to stop it? So, uh, but there should be no mandates from the federal government about what you must do. Uh, under the 9th and 10th, there would be essentially none. But the federal government does have responsibility for these borders, and uh, I just hate to see all these resources. I think that we should have much uh, more of immigration service on the border to, to uh, make it easier. It's hard to even get to visit this country. We're losing a lot of visitors and workers that could come to this country because we have an inefficient immigration service. And then that invites the illegal. We have to deal, we can't endorse the illegal, but the program today endorses the illegal problems. And a weak economy is always detrimental too because of the welfare state. We have welfare at home and some jobs go begging. We have jobs going begging in this country in the midst of the recession. It has to do with the economy. You can't ignore the economy, but also the welfare state allowing immigrants to come over and then get the benefits if you subsidize something, you get more of. So there's a lot we could do and we should do, and certainly this president is not doing a very good job. Without caveats or explanations, please define yourself using one word and one word only. Congressman Paul? Consistent. The Pentagon recently announced plans to open up 14,000 new jobs to women, putting them closer and closer to the front lines of combat. The, the problem is the character of our wars. Um, and I don't like to think of people in groups. Individuals have rights, not groups. So you don't have women's rights or men's rights. And we still have draft registration. What I fear is the draft coming back because we're getting way overly involved. And the draft, it, it, we keep registering our 18-year-olds. So when the draft comes, we're going to be registering young women. And because of this, they're going to be equal. Now. The wars we fight aren't defensive war, they're offensive war. We're involved in, in way too much. Or they're undeclared, they're not declared by the Congress. And so we're in wars that shouldn't be involved. So I don't want even the men to be over there. I don't want women being killed, but I don't want the men being killed in these wars. But because now we have accepted now for 10 years that we're allowed to start war, we call it preemptive war, preventive war. Well, that's an aggressive war. I believe in the Christian just war theory that you have to morally justify the warrants in defense. Now, if we're defending our country and we need to defend, believe me, when men and women will be in combat and defending our country, and that's the way it should be. But when it's an offensive war going where we shouldn't be, that's quite a bit different. So it's the foreign policy that needs examined.